So now we come to the second uh, concept or understanding that we'd like, that we need to understand if we're going to truly understand the development of our own soul. And that's the concept of absorption or understanding absorption. All right. So would you like to tell me what absorption is? <laughs> what is it? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's the, it's the principle that we cannot change unless the thing preventing change is released from ourselves. And, and so if, if we state it more clear, carefully, um, I cannot absorb any new truth, or let's state it another way, I cannot have truth flow into my soul while error exists in the soul on that same subject. And I cannot have new error be absorbed into the soul or flow into the soul if truth exists in the soul on the same subject. So this process of absorption is all about the change that occurs in the soul. It's all about, so remember the first point, preclusion, was about the state of the soul. This second point is about how we can make the soul change from its state to a new state. And what we're basically saying is the state of the soul cannot change unless somehow the error that's in the soul that causes the state to remain the same and the truth in the soul that causes the state to remain the same is somehow released, is, is given up. There's got to be a process by which we can give up both truth and error if we wanted to. And there is, and we can discuss that in another point. So this process of absorption or, or, the, or the concept of absorption is we cannot have a truth or an error absorbed into our soul while the opposite thing exists already in the soul at the same time on the same subject. And uh, if we understood this, you know, really understood this at the soul level, we would, we would give up trying to learn new things with our mind without going through some kind of process that allows those particular things to be absorbed into our heart, into our soul. So we, we'd give up that entire process if we understood this. What about um, if, if you're, you're learning a new truth but there's no error in your soul opposing that? Then the truth will enter it just immediately. Oh. It'll just go straight in. Yeah. Okay. It, it will flow in because there is an emotional openness to the absorption of that truth. The same applies to the error, of course. If, if there is no truth in the soul on a certain subject and there's no error in the soul on the same subject, right, then, then the soul is also emotionally open to absorbing error as well as truth. And this is what it is like for a child. A child, when they first incarnate and they first uh, are conceived, from that moment on, they're absorbing everything in their environment without check, without any resistance, because in their soul they started with a blank soul with no truth or error in it. And because there was no truth or error in it, in that blank soul, they, they can absorb anything. They can absorb truth and error. So if the parents were in a high amount of truth, then the child would start absorbing a lot of that truth. If the parents are in a high amount of error, then the child starts absorbing error. And what normally happens, of course, on the planet is that the parents are in a, you know, what we'd classify as an average amount of truth and an average amount of error. And as a result of that, then the child themselves also absorbs the same errors and truths that the parents had. And, some of, and, and so therefore starts acting upon them as they develop in their brain, in, in their mind. So would you say that this absorption is the experience of the truth as it enters you? Um, I don't feel the truth is an entity, because an entity implies like a being or a person. But, but the truth itself um, is available on any particular subject. And yes, it is. the process of absorption is the experiencing of the truth not as an intellectual concept or thought, but rather as an emotional experience. So this is why I often say in presentations to people that the truth is emotional. You can't accept a new truth without going through an emotion. And in fact, usually you can't accept a new truth without going through two emotions. The first emotion is the release of the error. And this is the concept that we'll discuss further in another section. And then the second emotion is the absorption of the truth. So, so the reality is, yes, the truth is an experience. 
that you have to go through. It's not ever going to be an intellectual concept if it's going to change your soul. So there are plenty of people who have heard the truth in their mind, but it hasn't changed their soul. And you put the same stimuli from, a, from an event onto their soul, some kind of trigger that hits their soul, they'll react completely different to what their mind would have suggested to them because the truth hasn't entered their soul yet. And the only way the truth is going to enter the soul is for the error in the soul to go through some kind of process of release. And we'll talk about the process of release as another point. But, but we need to understand this concept that we can't absorb new truth while error is existing. And we can't absorb even new error while truth is existing. So that's great too. So when we get to the point where we have absorbed a new truth into our soul, that is in harmony with God's truth. And remember, every time I'm referring to truth here, I'm referring to the absolute truth of God. We can't absorb that truth into our soul um, while an error exists. But also, while if the truth does it or it already exists in our soul, we're going to be impervious to error as well, which is fantastic. It means that we can't be manipulated in any way away from the truth in that point. But you said it is possible to release to uh, release a truth and absorb an error. Of course it is, yes. So what might be an example of that? Well, an example of that often happens during a child, our childhood, for example. So, for example, uh, we might have had, with one experience with our, in our childhood that most people have had, is, is where they're two or three years of age and for the very first time in their life they get belted by their parent for doing something. Now, in that moment, there is a deep, confusion within the soul of the child. Up until that point in time, the child has only received what you'd call loving responses from its parent. And the child has never had an experience of violence from its parent at that point, not that physical of violence that has created physical pain to their body. And then all of a sudden, the parent has reverted to some kind of physical action that is violent towards the child. That's an assault on the child. Now, the child goes through a deep deal of confusion in that place, right? Because it's never experienced that before. It's, never, it's only ever experienced what, it would, what we would say would be more loving feelings from the parent, right? Now, what happens generally, if that happens once, the child usually goes through a whole set of confusions. If it happens again, and then again, on, a, on a, any subject, the child begins to accept the error, Right? and give up the concept that something is wrong. Right? Initially it knows something is wrong because of the pain it's experienced, right? But after a while it gives up the concept that something is wrong and after a while it even starts to justify, and, I, and, and, and once we become adults ourselves, we often justify the physical punishing violence that has been perpetrated by parents towards us in our childhood. We justify it, saying, oh, I was a bad child or, or whatever. So we've actually come to the point of completely accepting the error by that stage. So it can be a progressive thing. Definitely, yes. A smidgen of truth gets lost, a smidgen of error gets Im imbibed as a result. As a bit more truth gets lost, another error imbibed as a result, and so forth and so forth, until such a point in time that the error is like a mountain and the truth is like a molehill. And therefore, the truth doesn't govern our actions anymore. The, error do, the errors govern all of our actions. Now, of course, the same process can happen in reverse. The error can be released a bit, bit at a time and a bit of truth will be absorbed about that particular thing. So, for example, if I was talking about this truth about my parents assaulting me during my childhood by using what we, net, what we call you know, punishing the child through or, or what we call disciplining the child through you know, a violent act. Now, I would argue that there's no such thing as disciplining a child through a violent act in the sense of from, from, from a loving perspective. But we won't arrive at that condition initially, just instantly, because we have all these concepts inside of our soul that it is a, it is a loving act to, for the parent to sometimes restrict the child's actions through violence, right? We believe it because it happened to us <laughs> and it happened to us through a lot of our childhood. So we come to accept that. Now, in terms of releasing that, I would go through, oh, that really hurt that my mum and dad did that. And as an adult, we might process some of that hurt, you know, that we got hit uh, quite frequently sometimes for things. That, and initially, it usually starts by getting, by feeling about the things we got hit about that we didn't deserve, 
Does it make sense that we, we knew we didn't do something wrong and they still violently attacked us in some way? After a while, we, so we released that emotion. So now we've released this emotion that we, that we didn't deserve being attacked for things that we didn't do. <laughs> we released that at least. And now we can accept the truth that nobody deserves to be attacked for things that they didn't do. Right? That we need to make sure of our facts before we go attacking anybody. This may be the subsequent result of that truth entering us. But we still may believe that our parents were loving even though they attacked us at other times when we felt we deserved it. But then we go through another emotion where we realise that we only feel we deserved it because our parents felt we deserved it. So really we, we, we felt we deserved it because they felt we deserved it and it was really some kind of, it was like an emotional blackmail or you could call it almost an emotional programming that caused us to accept that we deserved it. Does it make sense? Then we process through that emotionally. So we release that emotion of, ah, oh, you know, I've just accepted my parents' definition of the world all the time. I've accepted their definition of what's right and what's wrong. And I process through that emotionally. And then I realise I don't have to accept what my parents' view is right and wrong all the time. And then I start to realise that a lot of the things my parents said were right is actually, are actually wrong from a, from a perspective of love, right? And so now I've grown a little more in accepting more truth. And then I go through another process after that generally where, where uh, I start realising, wow, I got punished for all of those things they said were right and I didn't deserve to be punished. So now I process that emotionally. I release all of that emotion about how forgiving them. You know, I go through the process of forgiveness of them in that process of releasing that emotion. And now I come to terms with the fact that I didn't deserve to be hit ever. Now, once I get to that point, I'll realise that actually when my parents hit me, they were committing a violent assault. Right? And once I hit that point, I'll have a big ball or cry about, probably, if I want to release the error of that, that they have actually assaulted me. My parents have assaulted me. In fact, they assaulted me many times during my childhood. And if they had done that to an adult, they'd be in jail probably, still in jail for how many times they assaulted me as a child. If they had done that to another adult, they would have got put in jail many times as a result for that particular offence. Then I feel about all that and release all that emotionally and forgive them for that. Does that make sense? And I go through that emotionally. Once I come out of all of that, I am very firm now with the truth. And the truth is nobody, no matter their, whatever their age, deserves to be assaulted. And that now is a truth that is firmly in my soul. Nobody can shift it. And it doesn't matter how many people attack me and how many people justify their actions through God or through the Bible or through, you know, some other book or, you know, or justify it, I will be immovable. Because all of the error on the subject now has been released and I now know the truth that any form of assault on my person is an unlo unloving act. And that's how it usually happens, is this gradual flow. And so when I say any truth on a particular subject, I'm talking about that, inter that, that process, in the process I've just described, for example, which is a, really a subset of the actual process, and you can see that there was a little bit of truth that I had to come to terms with, and then the error could be, the error could be released and I could come to terms with that truth. And, then it, and initially I receive it intellectually, I think about it, think about it, think about it to the point where I get to releasing the emotion. Once I release the emotion, now the truth can enter me as a solid fact. And that's how, that's how change occurs. That's the principle of absorption. Right. Mm. Would, um, can I use another example? Sure. Like in growing faith um, as you grow towards God, yep. um, and you experiment with the laws mm -hmm. and you have an experience where the law of attraction feeds you back something and you're like, oh, I've had that experience. Yep. So I believe the law of attraction a little bit, mm -hmm. but not like totally. In not my... on every subject. No, <laughs> so just a little bit. And then you have another um, experience and they're like, I believe it a little bit more. Yes. So that's the same process. And so in just... a positive direction. Yeah. Yes. So you just have more and more experiences having released an error associated with it. Exactly. So, you know, initially we may have this feeling that the law of attraction is just a terror, you know, there's no such thing. No such thing as the law of attraction. You know, what happens to me just happens. 
And then, uh, then something might happen which seemed to be very co-related with, you know, something that, that you thought about. And, th and then you start going, oh, maybe I, should, maybe I should experiment with this. So that in itself is a shift of truth, does that make sense? But uh, yet to be determined emotionally because it's not entered emotionally. But to get to that point, I've probably usually had to release the anger and rage that I have that there is such a thing as a law of attraction. Does that make sense? So I've released a bit of anger and rage about this concept of law of attraction. And usually how I do that is by, I hear somebody talk about the law of attraction and I said, oh, that's a load of rubbish, you know, and all this anger comes up in me and everything. And that's where me releasing the blockage towards the concept. Does that make sense? And then something might happen in my life that causes me to think, well, what they said might be true. I might experiment with that. Because I've now released a lot of the anger about it, I'm now willing to conceive that it's possibly true. Right? And then once I've, so, so now the anger's been released, there's a little bit of a shift on the law of attraction. And then what happens is an event happens in my life that seems to be a very big event and, and, I, and seems to be related to something definitely that I do feel. And I'd go, oh, that's interesting. Or even before then, I could have some truth presented to me about the law of attraction. Initially, it might be something like, you know, um, the, the new age version of the law of attraction, which is this concept that you can think your way out of anything pretty much. And then I try to think my way out of it, think my way out of it, think it doesn't work at all and I get all angry and rageful about that and upset with the whole concept and give it all up. And there's some more emotion released. And then somebody presents the concept of the law of attraction to me that it's actually to do with your emotions that guide your law of attraction, what's going on in terms of what you attract. And, I, and then I can, well, yeah, I've now given up all the blockages to the belief, the denial of the belief, the concept that it's an, a, an intellectual process has been given up now. Now I'm open to the concept that it might be an emotional process. And now I can experiment with that. And in the process of experimenting with that, I'll learn some things that cause me to give up more emotions that eventually helped me come to see that the law is a loving law and based around, and then after a while I have so much faith in it that anything that happens to me, I always firstly examine myself so, because I know for certain that it's got to be something in my soul that created it. Eventually I get to that point. Yeah. But again, it's a gradual process. I release a little bit of error, a little bit of truth comes in. I release another little bit of error, another little truth on the same subject that I've just released comes in and so forth until I get to the point where it's built into a mountain of truth that has been absorbed by my soul and I'm now solid in the concept. And in that process of the incremental process, um, is that when can confusion can happen? Well, yes, because at that point in time, you've got bits and pieces of the truth on, on di different subjects all, all there, in, in there, um, because you've had to release the error about that bit. And so the truth about that bit can enter you. But the truth about all bits hasn't been released. Uh, the error about all bits hasn't been released, so the truth about all bits cannot be absorbed. And so during that phase, we often go through you know, what you classify as doubt or... or, or um, sometimes what you'd classify as regression, you know. So if we got some kind of evidence to the contrary that we didn't understand, that we attribute with our mind to being a flawed concept, we may absorb that error as well and we might go through little cycles in amongst all of that. So, and that does frequently happen for people where uh, they're not comfortable with the concept of doubt. They're not, and, and as you know, doubt creates a lot of discomfort internally, emotionally, emotional discomfort. And most people are not willing to release emotional discomfort. In other words, they're not willing to feel emotional discomfort, not understanding that the emotional discomfort itself is an error. Because why are we so uncomfortable not knowing? That's because when we were children generally and we didn't know something, we were often humiliated, laughed at, sometimes ridiculed and sometimes even punished for not knowing when it was in sincere case that we just didn't know. And so when we don't know as an adult, we actually have quite a lot of fear associated with not knowing. And as a result, that's one of the errors that needs to be released, our fear about not knowing. From God's perspective, there's no fear in not knowing. If we lived in a universe where we were never punished for not knowing something, then, or never laughed at for not knowing something, and never humiliated for not knowing something, then I doubt whether we'd have any blockages to not knowing something. I doubt whether we'd worry about what we do and don't know. 
We'd be like two-year-olds. We'd be like two-year-olds who have never been punished, who have never been controlled, never been laughed at, who would just go, maybe daddy this, maybe daddy that. You know, what's going on here? What's going on there? Why, 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 why? But my, my son was when he was two. Why everything? And, and that's what we'd be like in the universe we lived in. We, we, we wouldn't have any worry about that place. We wouldn't, we wouldn't feel like anybody's looking down on us in that place. Uh, even if, if we were an adult, we wouldn't be ever concerned about that place. But again, we can only get to that place by releasing the error. And the error has been imbibed through usually our childhood experience, absorbed into our soul. And now we have this feeling in our soul that says, if I don't know something, someone's going to make fun of me. If I don't know something, someone's going to make me feel humiliated. If I don't know something, somebody's going to punish me. And if I've been violently abused as a child when I didn't know, if I don't know something, somebody's going to torture me. You know, that that in the end might be the strength of that emotion, which is very overpowering, right? And unless that error is released, that emotion inside of me that's determining that reasoning is released, I will find it very difficult to go through doubt. I'll be in a panic every time I'm in a doubt as a result. Yeah. Okay, there's another example. Sure, yeah. yeah. Good on with that. So, yeah. um, still on absorption, obviously. Yeah. Um, Violence, the truth is that violence towards anyone is not loving. Yep. And the error is that that person made me angry, so violence towards them is fine. Yeah. That's justified. Yeah, so we brought up this example in the first principle too, but, but remember the first principle, was a, a, the first principle which was preclusion, was, was about the state of the soul. So while I have inside of me a feeling, preclusion says, a feeling of the opposite type cannot exist inside of me at the same time. So, so that's... That's the case with preclusion. Here we're talking about, let's say I want to absorb into my soul the idea that no form of violence is, is acceptable, that all forms of violence are unloving. Let's say I'd like to absorb that concept into my soul. But inside of my soul, the present point is, is and I admit to myself that it is present in the, uh, right at this moment, this idea or concept that actually violence under certain conditions is loving then you can see from this example that what I would need to do is I would need to look at the conditions under which I define violence as okay and I would have to release some error about those particular beliefs in order to fully accept that no form of violence is, is a loving act. Right? And so that means that for the new concepts to be absorbed in my soul, I'm going to have to go through some kind of process that that allows me to see the error and to see what, you know, the, what we could call the characteristics or attributes of the error, because it, it might only be under certain circumstances. For example, I might only uh, justify violence if my child's being harmed. Right? So I'm still justifying violence, but only a ver under a very slight or... or a very slim definition. Socially acceptable definition. Yeah, and often socially acceptable. And um, mind you, the murderer justifies violence under a, a lot of very wide definitions, right? Uh, and and so, uh, but but m many of us will become a murderer under certain circumstances. You know, for example, uh, if I become if if a person becomes if a woman becomes pregnant from somebody that she doesn't want to be pregnant from she might justify an abortion, which is a murder, under certain circumstances. The fact that she doesn't want the child. She's justifying the abortion. She's justifying the murder. So for most people on the planet, there is some kind of level of justification of violence uh, under certain circumstances. What we need to do is be willing to find out what the error is, why we justify the violence under those circumstances, and then we need to feel the error. We need to do something with this error pro to process it, to release it from our soul so that it no longer is in our soul. Once it's no longer in our soul, the pro this concept of absorption says the truth will be able to enter us really easily and we'll be able to completely live by it after that point with, that, with, with no impediments whatsoever. So I'm not sure whether this is this point, but yeah. is that an automatic process or do you have to long to, to God for that to happen? Yeah, the truth entering us is not an automatic process, just like the error leaving us is not an automatic right. process. Once the error has left us, is it automatic? Well, it depends, you see. If we're, if we're now choosing to do this progress, the change of the soul with God, then what we could be doing is we could be longing for God's love. And when this error releases us from our soul, 
the love will enter and the love will bring with it the truth that we're seeking. Does that make sense? But, it, but if it's a process we're doing without God, then we're not receiving God's love, but we still have the capacity to absorb the truth. But it has to be something that we choose to do with our will still. So, so it depends on what path we're on, whether we're on the way, the, you know, the divine love path, as people refer to it, or the way to God, or whether we're on the natural love path, or, 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 which is not the way to God, but the way to the becoming the perfect natural man. No matter what form of development we choose, there will be this process of having to release an error and to imbibe or absorb the truth. And how rapidly this occurs will depend on whether we got God's help to do it or not through receiving divine love or not. If we receive divine love, it can be a very rapid process. If we don't receive divine love, because, of, because divine love softens our souls, it can be a very rapid process. If we don't receive divine love, uh, because there's not that softening of our soul, then we have to choose to soften our soul, which is often a very difficult process to engage, which takes a lot longer time. But it's still possible. We can become the perfect natural man while we're on earth. When I say perfect, I mean perfected in love while we're on earth in terms of our relationship to our fellow man and women. And without God, we don't need to have God in that process. It's much easier if you have God in the process, but you don't need to have God in the process. But also if you have God in the process, if you absorb the truth immediately after you release the error, it kind of it kind of solidifies the release of the error and makes you more res resilient to more error coming in later. Exactly. So, so, for example, if we release the errors associated on the natural love path, we release the errors associated with this concept about violence, but we don't yet imbibe the truth, then there is the potential of further error entering our soul, isn't there? But if we've released the error and soon after releasing the error, the truth has entered us, then there's no more potential of the error being absorbed by the soul after that point. So, so there is a lot of advantages in doing it God's way, you know, with God's help than doing it by ourselves. But the reality is we can choose to do it by ourselves and still change to, the, to a point of, of the perfect natural man. Okay. So well, that's all the questions think, on that subject? Yeah. Yep. So probably if we summarise that subject, what we're talking about here with absorption is this principle that we cannot absorb something new unless the old leaves us. The old has to leave us in some kind of process, which we'll define in another section. It has to leave us first before the new will be absorbed. If we believe we've absorbed the new while we're still conscious the old is within us, then the new has only been absorbed into our mind and it has yet to touch our heart. And that's a very important point because a lot of people think that they have become a different person, but when you put them under pressure, they revert back to their old behaviour. And the reason why is because their soul has yet to change. They've only thought they've changed. They haven't actually changed yet. And what I suggest to people who are listening to this is that to truly grow in our soul, we must understand how the soul operates and we must understand this principle of absorption. We cannot grow in our soul unless there is some release that occurs that is stopping the growth of our soul. It's impossible for our soul to grow unless some release occurs, particularly if we have error with regard to that particular thing in our soul. It's also impossible for our soul to degrade in its condition once truth is absorbed by the soul. Uh, we won't degrade in our condition once truth is absorbed. It's impossible for us to do that too. So, so this is what we need to understand with regard to the soul and, and how the soul works with regard to absorption. Um, when you say it's impossible to degrade once you've had truth, um, you said earlier for a child though they can have repeated experiences where they start releasing a truth. Well, the, the, the difference for a child, but well, when, when it, it's not really different for a child. Remember the child when it first incarnates into the parents, it has no uh, truth or error in it. Uh, it's like a, a fresh sponge of every truth or error. And so it's very dependent on whether the parents have truth or error in them as to what the child will from that moment absorb. And it will be a process of slow absorption, obviously, over time. It's not going to happen instantly. Um, it will happen over a period of time through experience. And so, so the principles are still the same. But, but for a child, 
because there is no error and no truth to prevent anything, anything flows into the child pretty much unless the child at some point in the future has some point of view of error or truth in it. Now, of course, this is negating, and these principles, of course, are negating the other influences that are upon a child or upon all of us. We must remember that when we talk about the environment, we're not only talking about the parents who are with the child, but the child is capable of absorbing things from other people who are with it, including spirits who are with the child. Now, most children are given a guide, or all children are given a guide and a guardian from the moment of their conception. So that means that the guide and guardian also have the ability to transmit truth or even error to the child, and the child accept those truths or errors. And this is how a child often does receive truths without them being in their parents, because they have another person who's influencing them with the truth, which is their guide or spirit, their spirit guide or guardian giving them truths, which they then have absorbed because they've been open to absorbing those particular truths. So it's not just a simple matter of what happens with the parents with a child. It, we must remember that the entire environment is affecting the child. And that, in, that includes the environment of the people who are present on the earth and also the environment of the people in, around the child who are in the spirit world. And they will determine how much truth and error affects the child. And for this reason, many children know more truth than their own parents do because they're receiving the truth from guides or guardians who know the truth and they've been open to the reception of those particular truths because they had no error in them to begin with on those particular subjects. Mm. Okay. So we can basically, once we understand these principles, we can explain every single operation in our soul. That's the advantage of understanding the underlying principles. When we ignore these principles, we start believing that we've accepted things with our mind when it's impossible for our soul to absorb those things while error exists within the soul. And so if we understand this principle of absorption, then we will see that uh, it's, it's, it's really a waste of time to try to accept a new truth with our mind without also engaging the process of releasing the error that might prevent the absorption of truth into our soul. And we also can start engaging our mind to find the error that prevents the absorption. Instead of believing with our mind that everything's fine, what we need to do instead is go, no, I can feel in me that I have a different feeling than what I'm trying to accept in my mind and use my mind actively to find what that error is rather than using our mind to deny the error and say, I've accepted the truth when why well, I haven't really accepted the truth at all. And, and the, the, what's happening around me is proof that I've yet to accept it. So when I understand absorption, I will be far more conscious of using my mind actively to find the errors and release them than I will be trying to absorb truths in my mind only without releasing error. So we change the way in which we're using our mind into be uh, a way that supports the development of our soul rather than really opposing the development of our soul. Yeah. Cool. So that's the principle of absorption, absorption, if we can call it that. Clarify. What do you reckon, Andrew? We've got this unresolved now. We've got something we, we would like to clarify. <laughs> What's that? All of us. With All the, of us. With the truth <laughs> with the tr it's impossible for a truth to leave an adult once, once it's in. Like, for example, if an adult had a horrific uh, experience, something happened to them. No, if the, if, if the truth is actually felt in the soul by the adult, it's impossible for them to leave it okay. under any circumstance. So it's only in children that it's possible for it to change. Yeah, and if, for, for an adult, they can act as though they don't remember the truth. Right, but the truth is still within their soul. So, so it's sort of like... Um, should we, should we edit is this going to be under dominance or...? Well, yeah, it depends. You see, it depends upon what, what is dominant within them still, obviously. Because if a person honours their soul at all times, 
then it's impossible for them to act in out of harmony with their soul. But if the person does not honour the soul at all times, then what happens is their mind, their mind may dominate their thinking and their mind is quite illogical under certain circumstances with certain stimuli. So, so it may cause them to act in a manner that's out of harmony with the truth they've already accepted in their soul. But once the soul becomes dominant, it's impossible. Does that make sense? You, you, can't, you just can't do it because to do it would hurt too much. So say, um, say there's an adult who has a truth in their soul about mm-hmm. something, mm-hmm. about violence, for example. Well, let's say they have one about God. Let's say they believe in God and they and then know, they know have for certain some, God exists. Or, well, I was going to say with the other example, and then they have some hor- horrific experiences in their life yep. that causes them to, to change. They, it's impossible for them to change on that subject. They'll always know that God exists. Once, once they've received divine love and, and received that truth, they'll always know God exists. But they won't always believe in God's goodness. Right. Because there might be the openness to the concept that God is a God of wrath. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah. And so they might, they might change what appears to be changed their mind, but they haven't really changed their mind. They've never really had a truth or error on the subject exposed until the event. And then, of course, once it's exposed... They act in harmony with the error, believing that God is a God of wrath and somehow has punished them. Um, does that make sense in the example I'm giving? Um, but that could only have entered them if they had some other error on that subject that yeah. existed inside of their that. soul already. So, and, and there's a common one, and that is their parents were violent towards them and punished them and, as a result, and said that it was love. So now... You know, there's the concept in the adult who's now only believed in a God of love, but now they're starting to accept that God might also be violent because there is this predisposition to accepting it already that's within the soul that they haven't worked their way through yet. So it just depends on what they've worked their way through. Should we talk about this in the next point? Yeah, it can do. We can like use it as an example. Yeah, it can do. Yeah, it's it's. This is the issue with it is but. The majority of people will find, will find it very hard to understand what we're going through because until they themselves have experienced these changes in their soul, all of what I'm saying is really just an intellectual, it's really just an intellectual exercise. Does that make sense? And what I'm trying to do is show them, here what I'm trying to do is show them intellectually that they need to engage a different part of themselves other than their intellect. And that's a very difficult task <laughs> because... You know, in the end, they'll have to. We we have to use words somehow to describe a soul-based process that they're trying to use their intellect to resolve. That they really need to use their soul to resolve. Do, do you see what I'm saying? Well, yeah, because yeah. I didn't get it before, but now we're talking about it with examples. I can relate back to some experiences that I've had and go, "Oh, now we, now, now I know, I know what you what's mean." Happening. Yeah. But when I first read it, I was like, "I don't get it." Yeah. 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 And that's how it is for most people when, like, these are, these are what I would classify as, uh, and perhaps we probably sh- should just, all of what we've been saying, you could somehow include, Igor. But these, these, are, these are, all of these concepts that we're discussing, we've only discussed two of them at this point. But, but all of these concepts are soul-based concepts of truth that the intellect itself struggles to even understand. And so what we're trying to do is to try to help an intellect that doesn't understand soul-based concepts of truth that can only be understood by the soul itself. And, uh, and, and so that's a very difficult task, of course, to explain truths in that, in that regard. But what I'm trying to do in this discussion with people is try to help them see how they can measure progress that's actually occurred in their soul and the reasons why they revert to old behaviour. And the reasons why a person reverts to old behaviour has nothing to do with the fact that they've regressed. They haven't regressed. If, if, If something was truly in their soul, they could never regress. So when they seemingly regress, it's because... 
the, the truth wasn't in their soul in the first place on that subject and it was only in their mind. That's why they can regress. Does that make sense? So... I think so. Do you I, that was, how to yeah, I think, that? well, I started relating it to something about my, my, my own life, mm -hmm. and then, and then I. Well, got... remember, if if my, uh, something you've related to me in your own life, you mentioned how we, myself and Mary, went away last trip or so away, and then you just had these burning desires to drink alcohol <laughs> for some reason, right? <laughs> and I think from what you told me, you got drunk one night or whatever. Right? Uh, twice, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and and. You know, obviously you would have felt pretty bad about that at the time, but, but you then view that as a regression, right? But it's not a regression. On this particular subject of alcohol consumption, you have not made a shift yet. And, and you've only exercised your mind to, to make a change. The actual soul-based change has yet to be made. Does that make sense? Because once the soul-based change is made, you won't even feel a desire for it. In fact, you will find it quite repulsive. You'll find the But I did find it more repulsive than I used to. <laughs> of course, but so not completely Not so, completely repulsive at because, all. Because what happened was certain emotions came up inside of you, right? And, and you might feel free to discuss those emotions if you want to. You don't have to. <laughs> I know that sometimes I'm around. But certain emotions came up in you that overcame your repulsion. Yeah, it was... It was self-punishment that I was going through. Okay, so yeah. this is emotions regarding how you feel about yourself were so strong and strongly negative and those weren't ever dealt with and still, still aren't. not dealt with. No. <laughs> and, and as a result of that, there will be times when you revert to behaviour that you're not proud of through alcohol consumption because, because the particular thing that drives the desire for alcohol is still present within does that make sense? Yeah. And so it might appear to be a, 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 a regression of some kind, but the reality is there was never progression on that subject in the first place for there to be a, a regression. Does that make sense? Yeah. You're only conscious of it now because of your opening to your soul and your opening to other emotions and your other feelings. You're now conscious of the fact that, that you know, it feels bad when you have alcohol to that degree and, and you're conscious of that fact. But the reason for doing it has yet to be addressed. And once the reason for doing it is addressed, it, the error-based beliefs in the soul are released about yourself, about how you feel about yourself, then you won't feel like doing it because you'll feel like, how could I ever do it? How could I ever harm this beautiful body that I live in? You know, like <laughs> that's how you will feel inside of yourself. Yeah. Um, so sometimes uh, because... And, and this is what I notice quite frequently as well, is sometimes people receive intellectually a truth, they try with all their might to live in it, and then down the track they give it up. Well, my suggestion is if you can give it up, then it was never in your soul in the first place. Because if it's in your soul, you just can't ever give it up. It's as simple as that. And, uh, and so... But people, the problem I feel people have is they think that they can absorb things in their mind and then act, choose to act differently and that means that they've changed. And it means nothing of the sort. All it means is they've accepted it into their mind. And as I've said to you during this discussion and during our introduction on the subject, the mind is completely incapable of controlling the soul. The mind is subordinate to the soul. So anything that enters our mind, while it's, while it's just in our mind, has no real capacity to control our soul. We'll have to try and struggle and try and struggle and try and struggle and try and struggle and occasionally slip up. That's how it will be while the error exists in the soul on the same subject because the truth has yet to enter the soul on that subject. So it, <clears throat> it, can, um, it can be a bit... Um tricking to people in that they can change their behavior and then yes. they look at the whole preclusion idea and go oh look my actions are different therefore my soul condition is different yes but, but put, it's not but put them under stress but then they need to look at that law of attraction and look what happens under stress yeah yeah under stress your soul if it's got a truth in it it will not change under stress if your mind has a truth in it but the soul doesn't you will change you will change for certain. And that's why under stress, the stre in your case, the stress of feeling bad about yourself, 
was higher in terms of its pain than choosing to drink some alcohol was. And as a result, you just go ahead and engage the, the, the behaviour that's old behaviour, but it's never become, there's no new behaviour yet, really. That, that, that old behaviour is still solidified in the soul and will remain so until the reasons for it have left, have left you and gone. So, for, for example, there's some people who drink only when they feel bad about themselves. There's other people who drink for, for the sake of getting approval from their environment. So, so the only time they would drink is if they went around uh, to, you know, Christmas time to their family or something, somebody offered them a drink, they'll have a drink then, right? That tells you that the truth has yet to enter their soul on that particular subject at that, uh, for that particular time. And it's all related to the error relating to getting approval from the environment, getting, you know, feeling like you're a part of the world. Is, is the underlying emotion. So, so the beauty of all of these things occurring is the, the law of attraction through the soul condition attracts these events, showing to us the error in which exists still in the soul. And if we are conscious of it, we can say, ah, oh, okay, this, uh, this truth has only been in my mind for this entire time. So, for, for example, many people at the moment that we know who have been uh, you know, here listening to us for four or five years who, who have been now, you know, living or eating vegan, you know, or eating vegetarian or vegan, we know that many of them have not made a soul shift because you put them in a situation where they're going out to dinner or you put them in a situation where they're with mates or friends, bang, you know, they revert to the old behaviour. They have not yet made a soul shift. It's just an intellectual shift and therefore really quite pointless, actually. And this is one of the things that we must understand with intellectual shifts they are only advantageous so long as they affect the soul shift. And uh, if they do not affect the soul shift, if we, live in the, if we live in the false security of an intellectual shift without making a soul shift, it later on is going to affect us quite negatively. We need to make soul shifts if we're truly going to grow towards God. And if we really want to grow our soul, even to become the perfect natural man, soul shifts are going to be required at some point. And uh, without true soul shifts, we are going to keep reverting to old behaviour until the soul has shifted. Yeah. And we need to like, understand that. On the divine life path, uh, you know, when the, on the way to the God, God's way to God, we go through soul shifts very, very rapidly, actually, if we allow them to occur, if we're humble. But most people are not on the divine love path, even those who claim themselves to be. They're still on the natural love path, using their intellect heavily in order to change their behaviour. And as a result of that, they are going to find reversion back to old forms of behaviour fairly consistently until such a time as the soul has actually shifted on the, on the issue. Mm. Okay. So we need to understand that, really, yeah. if we're going to progress. And if we're going to progress towards God, you know, we can choose continually if we want to do to absorb things with our mind without soul shifts. But, but God's relationship is with our soul. It's not with our brain or our mind. It's a soul to soul relationship between our soul and God's. So unless there are true soul shifts inside of our soul, our relationship with God will also never change. And that, that's a very important thing to understand. So I, I feel that changing your mind does not affect your relationship with God. And that's another way to see whether you're changing is to see how your relationship with God is changing. Exactly. If your relationship with God is much the same as it was 10 years ago and you don't feel any closer and you've not received divine love since in that time or any of those things, then that should tell you that actually the soul has not shifted you might have thought it's shifted in your mind, but the soul itself has not shifted and has yet to shift. Otherwise, you would have the growing, continually growing relationship with God happening at the soul level that you would feel and it would overcome everything. It would overcome all of the negative influences around you eventually if you kept growing in that way. So for a lot of people, they have not experienced the soul shift even though they believe they have. And, and that's a sad thing because it, when you live in a false sense of security in that place, it's, it's sort of like you, you, you're, not, you're not being honest with yourself, but 
but also you're not recognising that God wants a closer relationship with you than that. God, God wants to have a relationship with your real self, not the fabricated self that you in your mind have created so that you can avoid your real self. Mm. So this is where like, the mind, like I said, has lots of limitations and also unfortunately misleads us many times. And, uh, and, and if, the, if the mind is developed without developing qualities of the soul, logic is not possible. Mm. Okay. That was an add-on bit to That was an add-on bit. <laughs> what should we call that? Uh, I suppose it's a bit of background information, isn't it, about about absorption, but also about how the mind works in... Uh, and preclusion. And preclusion. And in fact, some of the other principles, what we'll probably do as we discuss some of these more principles, is we'll probably have more little discussions like that that come up that illustrate particular points as an amalgamation of the, of the understandings that we're raising. Yeah.